We're now talking to former NFL receiver and Emmy Award winning, searching for the summit, Mark Patterson. What is doing? going on, Mark? God, there's so much going on. I, I actually played uh, uh, 18 holes today with Jim Mora, mm. the head coach at University of Connecticut, and there is talk about them moving into the Big 12, but, you know, potentially, we'll see. I was going to bring him on as a surprise guest, and things got a little too late, so uh, anyways, we had to leave him off at the corner. <laughs> yeah, he, he's on his way. He's staying here in Sun Valley, Idaho, and uh, I think headed back to Connecticut here in the next month or so. Well, well Jimmy is a very well-known coach. And very well respected around the NFL. So uh, it would have been nice to have Jimmy on. But I'm happy we just have you, my friend. Thank you. It, 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 makes, it makes the show just more interesting. Having Jimmy Moore take away the spotlight from you would be absolutely horrendous. We don't want that, okay? We want Mark. We want Mark Patterson. So tell us, since the last time we spoke to you, any mountains you've climbed since then? What? Yeah, and I you know I can't remember the exact date, and if you got, I'm not sure. I can see you right now. That's it's big, beautiful. That, there's the big hardware right there. It's and, beautiful. And I'm told that when you win a regional, you get the smaller ones, and when you get the big boys, which is the best picture for searching for the summit, NFL 360 produced it. Amazing film. Um, you know, you get the big boys, and there's nobody probably not deserving than me, but somehow or another, when you do things for the love of the game, um, like I played like I did with the NFL, I do right now for Sports Illustrated, and I did, you know, climbing the seven summits around the world to become the first NFL player to do so. You know, there's sometimes that there's amazing, amazing outcomes that come out of it that you were never intended in the first place, and that's one of them. Um, answering your question, uh, I'm about 30 days out from going back to Zermatt, Switzerland, to take on the Matterhorn. Mm. It's a very intimidating, crazy piece of rock that goes straight up right out of Zermatt, small little... Uh, ski town in the middle of, of Switzerland. And so I've been training like an animal getting ready for this thing to, to take it on. Did you take Jimmy with you? Or are you going to take Jimmy with you? Uh, Jimmy would freak out. <laughs> but he'll be, he'll be in camp. You know, I was there last year to do it. And, and my, my big mistake, my big miss is that I went in September and I missed it by about a week. And so we get up to the base. I'm looking up there. It's blowing hundred miles per hour. I really wanted to do it just because I'd gone that far. You know, you train, you train, you train, you train, you train. And then there's a guy that was right at the base. He'd done it about 200 times. He was a, he was a guide. And I said to the guy, to go, look at, what are the chances if I go for this, that I make it to the top? And he goes, it's a hundred percent chance you will die. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you know, it makes perfect sense. Spun around, went down to Chamonix, Clown Mont Blanc, got that done. It's 15,000 feet plus. Um, and so I was proud to to climb one of the highest mountains in, in you know, in Europe, certainly, and certainly in the Alps. And uh, but I want to go back and take on something I was not able to accomplish last year, which is the Matterhorn. Yeah, you also I, I saw on your Twitter that you were in Tanzania for a while. What was that experience like? Uh, you know, I've been there a couple of times now. I've climbed it a couple of times. And the last time I was there, I was with Chris Long. And Chris mm -hmm. is just a world class guy. Right. And. That the, the cool story out of all this, and he's a guy, for those who don't know, played 10 years in the NFL, got a couple of Super Bowl rings at the end with uh, the Patriots and uh, Philly. And uh, he started this foundation all about going down to East Africa and building water wells for the people. Um, originally in Tanzania, and now it's grown out into further in other parts of, of East Africa. But the day that we actually climbed up there, this is one of the only places where this actually exists, but there's a gigantic sign up there. It says, you're at the top of the world in East Africa or Tanzania. It says Kilimanjaro. And we're just sitting there. I put my arm around him. And I go, you know, there's not too many guys. As a matter of fact, I don't think there's <laughs> any guy that can say that they played with Howie, his dad, <laughs> and actually climbed Kilimanjaro with Chris, right? <laughs> so we both had a good chuckle about that. And it's true, right? I mean, it's just such a rarity that those two combinations, those two things would happen. As everybody knows, we are talking to NFL receiver, ex-NFL receiver, Emmy Award winner searching for the summit, Mark Patterson. You know, Mark... I don't know anything about rock climbing, okay? I've never done it before. I'm an extreme guy. I do a lot of extreme things. I've jumped. I bungee jumped off of bridges. I've, I've jumped off of planes. I've done all that stuff. But, uh, you know, climbing mountains and putting myself in harm's way is not something that I think I could do. Tell us a little bit about the training. What is it like to train for something like this? 
Well, I, I think there's a number of things in there. You know, it, one is commitment and, again, love of the game. Um, you just had on the punter, and I'm sure he's got an extreme love of the game of going out every day and competing and trying to make his team a better team. That's what I used to do in the NFL, and I transitioned that same passion, that same drive towards climbing. Um, I think it's really important to note that a lot of times when people go right to a mountain like K2 or Mount Everest or one of these other really tall ones, um, you know, they're like, how could I ever do that? Well, you didn't go from Little League to the NFL one jump, right? There was this iteration and progression that happened, you know, from the time I was uh, eight, nine years old playing Little League football until I ultimately, you know, 23 years old, I got drafted by the Raiders. And, and so, and there's a lot of learning, there's a lot of growing, there's, you know, not just physically, but mentally in terms of, of, of attacking that and, and taking those different things on. Same thing in mountain climbing, you know, I mean, I can't imagine trying to take on Mount Everest if you never try to take it off and just don't take one gigantic leap. These big mountains I've been on, 17 people died on Mount Everest this year. Many of those people were just inexperienced. They hadn't been at altitude. They don't know what to do. You know, they don't know how to self-manage themselves. So they got mission critical, especially in the death zone, which is above 26,000 feet, and didn't know how to handle that and get off that mountain. And it's unfortunate, but too many people are taking shortcuts. You know, there's an old saying about there's no shortcuts to the top, right? Here you guys are on this radio show, and I'm sure that if I turn this whole thing around and start asking you about where did you start, mm. and I don't know what your story is, but I know you didn't just get to where you are today by just, you know, saying, putting a sign out saying, I'm ready. You know, it took this, it took this you know, this art, no. this, this process, right, mm-hmm. for you to get where you are today. Oh, it's a huge process, and people don't realize. Everybody thinks. I remember. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story before we we get back to the interview. Yeah. My uncle is a computer genius. He's an engineer. He's built computer programs for many different companies. Made millions and millions of dollars for companies. Okay, and he told me one day he he was creating. Uh, what do they call that? Uh, you know, those crypto coins. He has. He, yeah. he created his own crypto coin, and he wanted to do a show. Speedy, you remember this? He wanted to do a show on the network, just talking about cryptos and stuff like that. He came on and he told me, "This is easy. I did this in high school. I did a radio show in high school." I said, "Okay, this is easy." Huh? So uh, we we put him over here, and I said, "Okay, for the next two hours, we're going to be your backup. Speedy's going to be your producer. I'm going to be your co-host." Go ahead. Give everybody, entertain people about cryptos for the next two hours, and you tell me how easy this is. I'll never forget. He was sitting here for the first 15 minutes. He was, uh, 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 uh. I said, are you, are you ready to move this along? And then all of a sudden, I came out here. I cracked a couple of jokes, knew nothing about cryptos, and started making jokes about this. I was looking at the numbers, and I was like, what the hell does this mean, you know, and all this other stuff. And... We went through two hours, and he sat there at the end of the show. I'm not lying anymore. He says, okay, I say, uncle, I don't know how you guys do a show for three hours, talk back and forth, and entertain yourselves and entertain people while you're doing it. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. That's what my uncle told me. And he respects it more now than he ever has because he actually saw how hard it really is. Well, I think there's a, you guys both have this. When you start interviewing, there's a skill behind that. Mm-hmm. And, and ultimately, just like sales or anything else that you do in life, you know, it's really about listening. And as listening can take you, you may think you're going to talk about this, but then we end up talking about that, mm-hmm. right? Just because you've listened and then, you know, the person kind of guides you along and that, you know, the power of curiosity. And that's what I think elevates conversations to make them super interesting and where you can go. And then also, just be able to make it through three hours, right? Like, where are you going to go? Well, you don't know. But if you listen long enough, you're going to find out. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned Howie Long earlier. What was he like as a teammate on and off the field? You know, Howie's the same guy that he was back then. He was super humble, um, super hardworking, very intense, uh, but just a good dude, right? One of the boys. And, you know, I was able to reconnect with him indirectly with Chris when I was in Tanzania. You know, that was the, the, that was when Chris had been let go by the Patriots and he was freaking out where he was going to go. Jim Moore was with us too. So Jim had been in NFL locker rooms for 25 years. Mm-hmm. So he knew the process. He knew where Chris, you know, his, his space was going to be in terms of, you know, first tier, second tier, third tier. And he pretty much called that bank shot of the way it was going to play out. Chris was all stre- stressed out. And at the end of the day, Jim was hundred percent right. He ended up with the Eagles and up going to the Super Bowl, won another Super Bowl ring. And, you know, it all worked out for him. And I think the year after that, he may have retired. 
And, and the funny thing is, when he went to the Super Bowl with the Eagles, he knocked off the team that got rid of him. So there he goes. Yeah, he gave uh, him the big F you at the end of it. Him and LeGarrette <laughs> Blunt did, did, did the same thing. They both left the Patriots, but went, both went to the Eagles and got their revenge. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's just weird the way that, that, that works out. And, you know, there's nothing but, you know, love and respect, I think. Of course. Different teams. It was just circumstantial. And, and I think Chris could have continued to play if he wanted to, but – I mean, shoot, the guy, I think when he was drafted originally number one, something like that, you know, way back Mm -hmm. 10 years earlier, you know, and somewhere in there, he got like a hundred million dollar contract. So he's sitting back going, you know, do I really want to go through this? You know, I got plenty of money in the bank. And, and so, you know, he retires and life's good and he helps others through his foundation and he's got a pretty good thing going on. He's got a good father. Uh, He comes from a very good family. He has another brother played in the NFL with the Chicago bears. Yeah. Yeah, So uh, they, they're very well respected as, as a a football family and, and what they have done on and off the field. So they're very, I've never met Chris, but long, long time ago, I would say about 10 or 11 years ago, uh, before I even started doing radio, I met Howie long at an event out in the Hamptons uh, and he was very, very nice. Very, very nice guy. Him, him and Michael Strahan. I've I've met Michael Strahan more than a numerous amount of times. Michael is one of the kindest, coolest people you'll ever meet in a conversation with. So, And you can talk forever with Michael. He'll stand there. If you know what you're talking about, he will continue speaking to you. He has no problem. So. Uh-huh. You know what, let me tell you something that's really cool. So I played for a couple different teams, and I just happened to be drafted originally by the Raiders. The Raiders have the best Raider reunions and alumni association. And you can ask a lot of players who played for other teams and then ultimately ended up with the Raiders. And every year, every summer, Mark Davis invites all the former guy. It didn't matter if you played one game or 10 years. Um, they invite you out to to Las Vegas. Uh, it's going to be, unfortunately, I take off for Zermont uh, to climb the Matterhorn roughly around the day that they're going to have this thing. But but I've been to two or three of them. You get yourself there. They put you up at the hotel. They wine. They dine. Treat you like gold. And the beauty is, you know, I'm hanging out with Howie and Jim Plunkett and, you know, a few years ago, Cliff Branch before he passed away. And Marcus Allen comes out and, and Lester Hayes and Rod Martin, you know, all these old famous faces. And they don't give a rat's ass whether or not you played a year or, you know, everybody's equal. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes it really cool, you know. And you're just talking to guys like guys. And, and it's just we're in this club. We're very fortunate. And, I, you know, I just I'm so grateful to the Raiders that they continue to to bring me around and treat me way, 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 way better than uh, what I probably <laughs> deserve, you know, based on merit. Yeah, we've had uh, ex Raider safety Stuart Schweigert on our show twice as well. He raves about a lot of those older guys too. He, he, Mainly Chris Cliff Branch, like you were saying, yeah. but also a lot of those other linebackers and safeties. He too. loves coming on this show. He really I- enjoys it. And and the one thing about Stu is he has a lot to say. Oh, yeah. He has <laughs> a lot to say. So uh, I sit here when, when we're interviewing Stuart, and Stuart knows. He's, he tells us at the end of the interview, he's like, did I talk too much? <laughs> no, no. The last time we had him on was because he played for Purdue, and that was right after they got knocked out by Fairleigh Dickinson in the tournament. They were the mm. second sixteen or oh, second one seed yeah. ever to lose to a 16 seed. So we had uh, one of our callers call in, and he was taking shots at Purdue. And then he literally, after that, we had him on the show as a guest, he, had, he actually came back in defeat just to argue with the caller. Oh, did he ever? <laughs> and he That's just... Awesome went crazy it was so funny <laughs> like that's how that's how much he wants to talk but he's got he's got a lot to say with that and i'm sure i don't know if you've encountered him in any of those alumni things but no, I, I, i'm not sure you know it, it's 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 got to a point um where i think i've been they've probably had five of them and i was in the kind of a couple of the originals and then just timing has not been there you know i think both years i was i just had conflicts i was doing speaking gigs or something or in this year you know going to zermont but, you know, it's just super fun to be there and be around the guys and for just, you know, 48 hours, kind of immerse yourself back into what life used to be like 30, 40 years ago. And then, of course, you quite quickly pop out of it. But, you know, it's just it's cool. And it's it's, you know, wherever you go, it doesn't matter who you are, whenever you're invited and you feel wanted into a special place in an organization like the Raiders, you know, it's just a really cool thing to be a part of. So I want to ask, I don't know if I asked you this the last time, but uh, the best memory of John Madden as a person and as a coach. I didn't know him. You know, I didn't, I didn't play with him. I played okay. with Tom Flores, and, you know, I could give you plenty of things on him or Al Davis, but 
Um, you know, nothing but fond memories. I've, I've met um, when actually I'd been traded to the Saints for my third year. And so I was down there and uh, we were playing a Monday night football. And as you guys remember, they, they used to have the Madden bus, right? Mm-hmm. And yes. He could not fly because he was freaked out about that. And so they pulled this big thing up. And of course, those were the days, I think he was on CBS with Pat Summerall and they, you know, his bus was very well documented. They do interviews in there and all kinds of stuff. And so they had parked that thing outside of our, our facility. And I went and I pounded on the door and the, the bus guy that, you know, his main driver opened. I went in there, he gave me a full tour. And John, I don't know where he was out to lunch or something, but. In the uh, bathroom. He, he could have been in the bathroom, <laughs> but I just sat there, you know, and just hung out and just absorbed it. And, and, you know, the amount of stories, you know, that I'm sitting here talking with the driver. I mean, he's really, he's the window of all these superstars that come, you know, into their, their bus or used to come into their bus. I had another a completely different, I just want to bring the substance on this thread. Um, years ago, I was in green Bay. And when you walk onto the field um, down there, the right edge before you go out, there's a, there's a room that has you know, the lawnmower and mm-hmm. it's where the, the, the head groundskeeper, this head groundskeeper had been there 50 years. Wow. And he, it, like, literally, this guy was a beauty of a dude. He went back to, like, Bart Starr days. Mm-hmm. And he just said, well, I just sat there listening to him. And he was going on and on about the lore and all, you know, Vince Lombardi, Bart Starr. And he just felt so appreciative to be standing on this hollow ground and, and the sacred ground of something that has become such a magical place to play seeing all the Brett Favre drama you know Mm -hmm. I mean it was just really cool so every once in a while you get to be around people like that there are gateways to you know what they have seen in life and it's pretty interesting pretty cool we are talking to former NFL receiver and Emmy Award winner and for searching for the summit Mark Patterson you know Mark there obviously you're a former NFL player you're an Emmy Award winner but now, what you've been doing over the last couple of years is working for Sports Illustrated. As a matter of fact, you're an executive over there. Uh, tell us a little bit about the growth of Sports Illustrated. There was a lot of transition with radio, and obviously, yeah. the swimsuit edition is one of my favorites, by the way. Uh-huh. It's fantastic. You know, I, Every year, I, I go out. Uh, I try not to buy the magazine. I know I'm trying to be cheap here, but I'm just kidding. I actually buy all the magazines. I hide it under my bed. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Mark, I'm not selling anything here, but uh, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your work over there well, at Sports I, Illustrated. You know, it's really interesting. So, so kind of the bigger picture is I helped start this technology company, and, and, and that company three and a half years ago, we had an opportunity to take over Sports Illustrated, which we did. And, and so when we did that, it, Sports Illustrated was more or less a sinking ship, and it wasn't too much different from all the other magazines and, and other – newspapers that we've all seen blow up and it blew up for a number of different reasons. It was blowing up for a number of different reasons. And so I had come in and I said, look, I want to start a new vertical of a collection of team sites on the SI domain. So we have a Cowboys and Broncos, you know, we have the NFL college football, power five, uh, NBA, major league baseball, all these companies blowing up. And I said, why don't we do everything exactly opposite? And I'll give you this in a nutshell. Today, what's happened over the last 10 years plus is that cell phones have kind of redefined the way that we consume content, right? Mm -hmm. And every 10 seconds right now, this conversation that we're having, you know, we're engaged right now, but you'll get off and you'll have all kinds of notifications from Facebook and texts from friends Mm -hmm. or, or whatever, right? And so... That has driven this whole thing where we just want quick hits and they come through because they come through on their phone and our attention span is very limited. The old school way of doing this was these columnists writing 2,500 words twice a week, right? And there was just no return on investment by doing that. So we said, what would we do if we started this this collection of team sites and feed people what they want based on what Mm. you're passionate about? I went to the University of Washington. Right. So I don't give a rat's ass about USC and all these other teams. And what Sports Illustrated have been doing for years is just writing about the state of Major League Baseball. And so I said, let's hone in exactly. That's number one. Number two is I said, let's just do quick hits, 250 to 500 words. We unlock the magic keys with Google. Okay. And then number three is let's put a one to three minute video. And so let's feed them exactly what they're already getting on their phones and all these notifications. And we have just blown that thing up. We were ranked. So in the world of, of television, we've all heard of this thing called Nielsen. Right? Of course, I don't yes. know how in the hell mm-hmm. people measure people watching television, but they do. Mm-hmm. 
And in the internet world, it's called comp score. It's the exact same thing. Sports Illustrated was number 17. We said, we're going to do everything opposite. We got, you know, it was like eternal war. But at the end of the day, we went out. Now we're sitting at number four. Number one is ESPN. You got CBS up there, Yahoo, and then it's us. And we were, SI was well, well on their way to, to becoming completely irrelevant. And we have come back and made the company relevant again. And I do believe that we will be number one, you know, within the next couple of years based on our growth strategy. Well, and it's all because of you, man. I, well, it, it's just, I'll tell you what, it's its a lot of... I'm just uh, messing. I, no, 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 no. But, but it, I mean, I, 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 it was my vision to mm-hmm. do this. Of course. So I'll take credit for that. But, you know, every once in a while, you have to think different. And I think that is what the whole point of what I'm trying to say. I'm not brilliant. I would just, I was just took a step back and like, rather than everybody do the exact same thing, which everybody was doing for 50 years, I said, why can't we just look at things and do things different? Otherwise, we're going to be like everybody else. And by the way, SI was already sinking. And so I just said, let's just do everything. Now, you know, today we look brilliant. At the time, it was a risk because we didn't know if it was going to work, right? But it turned out, you know, and we we do, you know, uh, we've got huge visibility now, you know, worldwide. Well, you should pat yourself in the back. First of all, Mark, just so you know, there are a lot of hip-hop artists and a lot of singers that said most of their best music comes for five minutes making it. So for you to come up with an idea just off the head saying, you know, let's do all the opposite things that everybody yeah. else is doing, that's a genius move. That's a, that's a obviously, you're, you're taking a chance and you put yourself in at risk, but you have to take risks if you want to succeed. That's in any kind of business. That had a lot to do with you, so you should be, hey, I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to pat yeah. you on the back. There's this book called, I read years ago, and it really, you know, like when you start, you know, we were talking about before, The Power of Curiosity. And I, I, and I think this really plays into if, if you are a person who are naturally curious about why things work, then you will be driven to ask questions on if something's not working, like ask the questions like how would they, could they potentially work? And there's this book called Good to Great, okay? Mm-hmm. And it was this 10-year study from this guy out of Stanford that looked at all these different companies. Companies like Apple that were dead on arrival, you know, they, they, they're phenomenal now, but there was a period in time when they were dead. Right. And that and then and, and the founder came back in and, you know, redid everything. There's other examples like that. And there's also examples like CompUSA that was, you know, 20 years ago where the king of selling computer products, and all this kind of stuff. They didn't evolve with the times. There's Blockbuster. Right. Mm-hmm. They didn't evolve with they had they were at a corner on the market of, you know, that's the only place we go and get our cassettes. Right. Hey, what are you doing tonight? We're going to the Blockbuster. Right. And get your <laughs> DVD or whatever. Right. And that's what we used to do, but they didn't evolve it into a streaming service. And, and so you see this, you know, right now, uh, Uber, right? Mm-hmm. The, the idea is a taxi, but now like, well, how can we make this a better experience? And so it, it's that whole thing about asking the question of like being curious and, and, and then being brave enough to step up and roll the dice and see where that goes. And I think that can get you a lot of places. So the last time we had you on the show, you were talking about some of the other quests that you had with the with the climbing. You mentioned Mont Blanc before, but also you said Jackson Hole, Wyoming was another big one. And you also, you being from Idaho, you had a couple spots there. What were those experiences like? Well, uh, down in uh, Jackson Hole, you've got the Grand Teton. And again, it's a big, gigantic, the Teton range is insane. Just for, if you're sitting there having a cup of coffee, looking up at it, let alone to like actually climb up this thing. And I wanted to do that because it was going to be my first experience really climbing hardcore straight up you know they, there's one section called the chimney so you can imagine a chimney you're going straight up with 2,000 feet straight down um and then you know jumping off blindly um this cliff you know 100 yards down one two three jump and just hoping that you know the rope's going to work and all that kind of stuff um but it you know it's insane it was tiring um it was fatiguing but you know it was amazing here in Sun Valley Idaho one of the reasons going back to a question you asked earlier about you know how have I been able to do this I wanted to move to, to 6,000 feet I was at sea level in, in Manhattan Beach it was just like if I'm going to go all, all in I'm going to go all in I want to move to a place that probably saved my life Mount Everest when you know I had been on the top my Sherpa left me I ran out of oxygen I was snow blind and I was asking myself how in the hell am I getting up this mountain and and trying to figure that all out and I think because you know, I, 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 I live in altitude. I climb to 10,000, 12,000 feet almost every day. It helped me survive through those moments. Unlike a lot of those guys this year, part of those 17 that we talked about earlier that passed away because 
you know, they just didn't have the experience and they hadn't, you know, immersed themselves in the mountain culture enough to really learn what to do when things go south. We are talking a former NFL receiver and Emmy award winning for searching for the summit, Mark Patterson. Last question for us. And it, it's so interesting because I want to know what you thought about this whole Titan sub implosion. Uh, obviously there were stories coming out over a couple of weeks ago that this submarine disappeared on a Sunday and they were trying to find it for the, for, for 24 to 48 hours, couldn't find it. And then they find out, you know, after investigating it, that it, it imploded and uh, completely was gone by, you know, 2000, 3000 feet. What were your thoughts to that? Would you have been one of those guys? If you had the money, would you have been one of the crazy guys to try something as ridiculous as that when it wasn't even tested? Yeah, um, it, you know, that, that, that actually gets pretty interesting. I'm originally from Seattle, mm-hmm. right? Went to the University of Washington, which is based in Seattle. And Stockton is the guy who's the inventor of the company. One of my best friends was an, event, uh, was an investor in his company. Mm-hmm. You know, so he was based out of Seattle. And so he'd actually been in version one. This was version five. Right. Right. And so he had gone down on, in the Puget Sound, which is our body of water right around Seattle there. He had gone and they, you know, I don't know, a thousand feet down or something and look at a shipwreck. And he was just like, after 20, this is my buddy, Rick, telling me about this. He was like, look, dude, after 15 minutes, I was gone. <laughs> like, cause you go down hundred feet and it's pitch black. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and you might see like a squid or something come by your window, but there's only, it's a, it's a, you know, you're in this cylinder and there's only one window and that's the front and that's it. It's pitch black. And, you know, obviously the thing wasn't tested enough and who knows exactly what happened. But as soon as there was a leak, like you said, the whole thing imploded. Would I have gone down? No, I, I don't like to be in small confined spaces. Um, you know, I've, I've worked out a number of times with Laird Hamilton, big wave surfer, pretty famous brand. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think he was the first guy to do a, a hundred foot wave. And, you know, I was at his house working out with Jim Morgan and, and Laird and Gabby. And, you know, his whole thing is about trying to get underwater and hold your breath. But you're talking about a whole different level because you're talking about falling off a 100-foot wave, which I can't even imagine. But now you're being pushed down underwater. So now it's just about holding your breath. You're not exploding because you're, you know, 5,000 feet underneath. Mm. I can't imagine that. I like to go up. You know, Laird likes to, relatively speaking, go down. But that's just a whole different level. But I think just like the the the, the general concept, because where we where, where we went with this whole thing, and you see the the James Cameron um, who did Titanic, he's they're trying to get in this exploration because like seventy five percent of the oceans have not even been explored yet. Mm-hmm. So like mining and other things, and I think that's where he was trying to go with that company. Interesting. It's very yeah. interesting. Mark, keep up the good work. We will definitely be reaching out to you again a lot sooner than later. Uh, you're a great interview. You give us so much information and look, you're all over the place, man. You know, this guy, you know, that guy, you just gave us some new information for that imploded submarine, that Titan yeah. sub. So there you go. You know, I have a, there's a, another company that wants to do a film. Um, I've got a book in the works. Mm. Um, I'm talking, I'm, I'm hooked up with some, some guys from SEAL team six about jumping out of planes um, and uh, in Moab and, and, class five rapids down some pretty crazy stuff that we're talking about doing together. So, you know, let's get on within the next year. I can give you a recap on the Matterhorn and uh, maybe you, know, you can, can get after it. You can, uh, you know, bring us in as, you know, uh, actors in that movie. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I don't know. You, know you two would be, yeah, you guys would be the clowns <laughs> on the side of the street. <laughs> We'll see if we'll see if next time we have the we actually got Jim Moore to show up too. All right. Mark, thank you, man. All right. Hey, you guys are awesome. I so appreciate being thank on the you. show and I'm available anytime you want me to come on. You're awesome. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay, buddy. Take care.